Welcome to Alaska Earthquake Science Facts. I'm Carl Tape. In 1958, Northwestern Alaska hosted the second largest earthquake ever recorded in the Earth's Arctic region, magnitude 7.3 near Huslia. Here's a terrific view of plate tectonics and earthquake activity centered on Alaska. What you see are the boundaries of the plates labeled here. There's the North America plate, Eurasia plate, Pacific plate. The Pacific plate is subducting along this margin. And that process turns out to be not just confined to the plate boundary. We look in at Alaska, we see earthquakes over much of the state, almost anywhere it seems could host an earthquake. And the one we're going to be looking at occurs in this region right here in the past 1958, Huslia. The significance is depicted here is just that Huslia is a long way from the plate boundary. So we need to invoke something other than simple plate tectonics to describe how such a large earthquake can happen so far from the plate boundary. There are certain places on the planet where this can happen. The Indian collision with the Eurasian plate forming the Himalayas is one of them. We see from another science fact that this block right here is creating quite a collision. And a lot of this deformation associated with subduction seems to be spread out across the entire state. So here's Huslia, long ways away. Also mention a smaller one, but even more north, the Kaktovik earthquake in 2018. The other one larger than anywhere on the planet to have occurred north of this was in uh, Baffin Bay in Canada, as it turns out. So we'll focus on Huslia. And our story focuses on a pair, really, Neil Davis and his wife, Rosemary. Neil died in 2016, was a scientist and writer. And two pieces of this story uh, can be shown here. One is a paper published in 1960, a field report on the Alaska earthquakes of April 7th, 1958. And the other is essentially a memoir, a story of a 1950s college education in Alaska in warmer climes. I believe Neil was the fourth person to get a PhD in the University of Alaska system. It was in uh, space physics. And along the way, he was trained as a seismologist with the likes of Charles Richter, Bino Gutenberg at Caltech, while driving home to build his cabin and home and raise a family off of Miller Hill here in Fairbanks. So really interesting character. Um, and we'll focus on some of his science adventures here. This is a slide provided by Neil Davis when he came and gave a talk a few years ago um, here at Geophysical Institute in the Seismo Lab. So these are Neil's dates and we'll focus on this one. The earthquake happened in April 7th, 1958. And there was a 10 day adventure here. Rosemary and Neil traversed damage zone, taking photos, collecting soil samples, doing borings plus various measurements. And so we'll show some of the, the pictures from that. The main thing they found flying over was that there were sand flows, rivers of sand and mud that had shot out of the ground in a large area uh, near Huslia. This is not typical uh, for any earthquake, although there have been a lot of cases of kind of liquefaction, shaking, causing uh, overpressurized sand and material to, to liquefy. Well, in Huslia, a lot of this, you can see the size of trees in here, the large sand flows. Here's Neil's map. As I say here, how about a 10 day spring? I put that in quotes because April and spring, especially in this area would uh, be likely to be more like winter across the Alaskan wilderness to look for earthquake effects. And the photos here are a mix of different trips uh, during this summer season. So they went back a couple times, but they land here and they've got to get by foot uh, over 10 days from here all the way to the village of Huslia. Here are characters, Neil Davis with a pipe and Rosemary with the gun, 1958. These are our characters. Uh, the caption was small scarp and dune sand with some extruded river deposit sand below, photographed in late summer 1958. 
and the photograph of Rosemary shown here. Gray river deposit, silty sand ejected onto surface in flat area, rosemary on surface of sand flow, 3030 at the ready. You can tell from the captions that Neil was very proud to have a wife to join him um, in an essential capacity on these scientific adventures. And here's an image uh, taken by Neil Davis. All this mud is coming out from this particular earthquake. And we'll see an annotated version of this, again, made by Neil for this Huslia expedition. Shovel, boring bar for samples, photo case, gas bottle, sleeping bag, brunt and compass. Um, and as he points to his wife, the all-purpose tool, combination, gun bearer, note taker, photo scale, hook. So some earthquake field work can be done in these circumstances, and we're very lucky that Neil and Rosemary had an opportunity so soon after the event to get out there. So we'll look at this at a few scales. You're from an airplane, you can see the scope of some of these sand flows. They were uh, over wide areas, and we'll see what some of these look like on the ground as well. Here's an aerial photo. Um, the uh, caption is talking about the size of the sand flow. Arrows illustrate underground flow of silty sand from smaller pit area and subsequent channel-like collapse. So these are large, 110 feet across. There is a combination of sand flows, but also areas where material is collapsing and ejecting out of other areas. Here, zooming in a little more, a small lake or moss-covered lake with a single crack through which lake bottom mud was ejected. So you can still see scale here. These are trees on the side. Um, and now getting down to the ground, uh, we have sand flow several feet thick. It's a little unusual. You can imagine several feet thick of just sand and mud um, flowing through the flowing through the forest, leaving them a record to try to understand how it all got here and document it. Here's a shot by Rosemary Davis. Um, I like this because it's so hard to tell what direction is up. The man we can assume is standing up and down. But if you remove the man, it becomes a little harder to tell um, what is up and what is down. But this is the kind of chaotic tumble you can get in these magnitude you know, 7.3 earthquakes that are close enough to the surface to cause this kind of shaking and deformation. USGS helicopter atop thick sand flow and collapse area partially covered by the flow. Um, just a reminder, helicopter remains the way to get around in these remote areas. It is challenging to assess damage um, when access is, is limited by helicopter. So you have to be ready to uh, change on a moment's notice and get out and try to collect information. So what about in Huslia? So there's a couple instances in Huslia where there was some damage to the cabins. In general, these log cabins are quite built well to withstand strong shaking, or at least they, they're not built to withstand them, but as it turns out, they do withstand strong shaking. And this caption showed boards are helping to hold up logs that pop loose during the 7.3 earthquake. This just shows a zoom in on, on these boards and the logs. There was one other photo. This one's by Neil, man touching a log that popped loose during the 7.3 earthquake. You can see a close up there of the, of the cabin. So not much damage caused by a pretty large earthquake and they're, very, they're pretty close as well. The, the shaking intensities were very high um, and yet not much damage. You won't read all of this, but sort of wrapping up, I like that this image showing a pit wall, showing what appears to be layers of river deposit, silty sand intruded into the brown dune sand during the earthquake, or perhaps in place by earlier seismic events. And so you can see these different layers suggesting that maybe this one down here represented an older uh, event. And even in the publication, in the seismological journal, Neil mentions the older residents of Huslia remember a large earthquake of size comparable to the one in 1958, which they thought occurred before 1930, and quite possibly a number of years prior to that date 
it seems likely that the gray sand deposits are sand flows associated with former earthquakes and perhaps with the one mentioned above occurring before 1930. So an interesting connection of some recent geological information trying to understand from the oral history and information of the elders at the time in 1958 to try to understand whether there was generational connection of these stories from earlier events. Takeaway topics. First one is that large earthquakes can occur in Alaska far from the plate boundary. Some geological evidence of earthquakes such as cracks in the ground disappears quickly after the earthquakes. And so you need to get in there and get measurements to preserve that record. Some geological evidence of earthquakes such as a muddy layer that gets buried may be preserved for decades or even centuries. So some evidence we might be able to find much later, in which case we may be able to look further backward in time to see those. Lastly, log cabins are able to withstand strong shaking. We see this again, uh, some cabins on the Denali Fault in the 2002 magnitude 7.9 earthquake. Thank you for watching. Stick around for supplemental notes. Just drop this email in from Neil Davis. He was writing at the age of 84, enthusiastically helping with photos and digging up this story. But this is the information trying to understand who took what photos from the two cabin shots.